Greetings, everyone. This is uh, Brother Kapow. You're listening to the Kapow Radio Show. I'm flying solo today on Monday, July 16th. We're going to continue our study into 1 John chapter 4. We're going to just do six verses today, break it up naturally. And then after that, it's a big love uh, love chapter, you know, or a lot about love. But right now, today, we're going to talk about false prophets. False prophets and the test of false prophets, right from the book of John. Now here, once again, here's a uh, an apostle who actually walked with uh, Christ, actually walked with God made flesh, sat under his teaching, ate with him, touched him, you know, traveled with him, experienced all the miracles right from the beginning. Uh, this guy's witness is incredible, as, as all the apostles were that actually uh, walked with him that actually saw him and we understand you know apostle paul uh, was called an apostle uh, because he saw christ in a different way but he never actually walked and talked with him like these guys did these guys um had an incredible witness and that's what they were called to do to witness god coming on earth manifesting in flesh and the reason god did that is to defeat the works of satan that included his, um, not only his teaching, and, uh, but his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And breaking that old covenant, it broke that old covenant, that old Mosaic law, that covenant given on my, uh, Mount Sinai. It broke that. It broke that and created a new covenant in his blood, right? Now, the laws didn't change. It wasn't like a new set of laws. It's the same laws God has always laid down, but the way you approach God was different and you didn't need the blood of bulls and goats and you didn't need a priest system anymore. You didn't need the temple system and all that theocracy, which was set up by Israel no longer was um, needed after Christ. So his blood was the propitiation of our sins. It was the final sacrifice. And we come to the Father. We come to reconciliation with the Creator God through his Son, his only begotten Son, which was begotten in the flesh and came to destroy the works of the enemy. And this is what John was witness to. This is what the Apostle John was privy to. And his writings aren't that easy to to grasp because like we have said before it's um he repeats it's repetitive um it almost is a push and pull kind of a thing he'll say one thing and then the next verse it kind of almost seems like it contradicts it and um and we, we've broken all that down as best as we can understanding also that there are uh things lost in translation oh oh <laughs> sorry to break it to you folks but you know things that were written in aramaic or in original greek i don't know which one it was you know but you know you you take that and you translate it into another language uh, in our case the english language there are things that are going to be lost in translation i don't care how good the translators are uh, you're going to as a human being um and as a group of human beings sitting in a council of of translating these things or scholars, you're going to come across issues where you're going to have to arrive at some consensus of what it means or how best to describe a, uh, a certain ancient Jewish practice or idiom or saying the best way in English. And sometimes you, we don't quite get the, the full impact. You know, we should all know that. Um, is it the word of God infallible? The word of God is God's word is infallible. Are the written translations infallible folks? You're kidding yourself. If you think there's no error in translations, God's word is infallible. The spirit behind it, what God says, and he will lead you to all truth. And that's, this is something that's hard uh, for a lot of us to really embrace that the Holy Spirit in you, Christ's Spirit in you, that Holy Spirit, that Holy Seed in you will guide you in all truth. In fact, the Apostle John says, you need no man to teach you. It will guide you into that truth. And we use that written word as a guide, as 
we we read it it's um it's a policy it's not so much a guide it's a policy that's how we live our lives and we understand things to the best of our knowledge but if things are lost in translation if it's like hmm, you know we really don't get it the holy spirit will give us the spirit behind it the just behind it you understand what i'm trying to say so we don't have to worry so much about you know, oh my gosh, you know, um, you know, unless, unless it's a, a total heretic Bible, you know, like these Jesuit Bibles where they purposely leave things out or purposely try to degrade Jesus Christ. Or, you know, it's a her- it's a heretic Bible. I'm not talking about that. I'm, I'm talking about, you know, King James. I'm talking about these other older translations, you know, uh, the Geneva Bible, Tyndale, things like that. You know, you have men or groups of men or groups, you know, scholars that are looking at these things and and doing the best they can, hopefully, to interpret a, another language the best way to 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 make it uh, understandable to an English speaking audience. And then, of course, the other issue we have is our own language has changed over the hundreds of years. So, what was written in 1611, a lot of times, uh, just doesn't make a lot of sense to us in uh, 2018. The other day, I, I came across a word. It's the only time it's in the Bible, in um, in Samuel, crack nails, crack nails, and the stories about um, Jeroboam sending his wife uh, in disguise to go talk to a prophet. And uh, it says, you know, she brought some uh, a, a cruise of honey, and um, you know some other things as a gift. But it says it brought crack nails. And I said, what the heck is crack nails? Well, it comes from a Hebrew word, which basically means moldy, you know, moldy. But the word, the old English word meant like a, a wafer or a biscuit that had holes in it, like perforation, almost like a cracker. So a lot of times it's translated, you know, like cake, you know, or, or biscuit. And of course, you know, if you think of cake, like a birthday cake, you know, you're not going to understand, <laughs> you know, if the Bible says, you know, he ate figs and cake. You're like, wow, vanilla cake. They didn't even have cake. And so you have to understand the cake or a fig cake was, was different than what we perceive cake. Uh, a crack nail apparently was a word that they used back in, back in the day. And so today we don't use that word crack nail. So, you know, it would probably be more understood to say she brought a cruise of honey and uh, cakes or, or a biscuits or something like that. But the spirit behind it is the same, right? Even if you don't know exactly what a crack nail is, the spirit behind it is that she brought gifts to this, this prophet, you know, to seek his, uh, his opinion on Jer- Jeroboam's continued reign. So I, I hope I'm making myself clear. I don't know. Hope I'm not rambling, but anyway, the apostle John, we try to understand the best we can. And I think that's how I got on that topic. A lot of times it's it's hard, especially after next week when we start talking about love. It's It gets very repetitive. Um, it, you know, we caught where he said, you know, little children, you know, um, you know, uh, you know, blessed are you because you've, you've overcome or the, the young ones overcome and then the fathers and, and so you're like trying to really make sense of all this stuff. And so we really need to rely on discernment and the Holy Spirit to guide us into that truth that he wants us to know here. Uh, needless to say, this is very, very heavy stuff. John doesn't write anything just to write. There's no word wasted. He does, it's not written just to, to write it. So it's our duty to allow the Lord to bring these things to our knowledge, okay? Our knowledge in Christ, that's what this is all about. Not just knowledge or gnosis for our own sake, but knowledge of our Savior. All right. So chapter four, chapter four starts off with beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God. Because here's why he says to do this. Many false prophets are gone out into the world. Earlier, we read that he had stated many false prophets came out from among us, the church, the believers in the first century. They didn't. And it's even today. It's like this today. You know, the false prophets that are, that are teaching in many churches and ministries 
all these um, heresies and things like that, they're, they're not coming from Anton LaVey's Church of Satan. You know, they're not coming from there. They're not coming from, uh, you know, the National Atheist Association. They're coming from Christianity. They're coming from the church. And they're false prophets, and they come out from among us. And that's why they're false prophets, and they seduce people, lead them astray. And John's warning about this, and we should be warned about this. They've always been with us. They've been with us at the time when he wrote this, you know, 1900 years ago or something. Um, And they're still here, and they've increased quite a bit. And in this six verses, there's a couple of really strong verses that we like to rely on a lot here. And this is one of them. This is one of them that a lot of people uh, rely on and beloved, you know, believe not every spirit, but try the spirit. And the word try there is to test literally or figured figuratively. It means to approve or discern, to examine, right? So critical thinking. Uh, one of my big pet peeves is, you know, when you walk into the, the doors of a church that you suspend your critical thinking you should never do that. You should always keep your critical thinking. And all these people that love to quote that one scripture, you know, judge not and you shall not be judged and, you know, all this stuff. It has nothing to do with critical thinking. They Once again, they're equating judging with criticizing in the modern sense. Like, don't judge me. That's, that's not what it was 2,000 years ago. It was really being a magistrate. It was really judging your own people as a judge. You're sitting there judging their behavior. You said, don't do that. Um, because you've got, you've got a big moat in your eye, you know, just that's up to God, but it has nothing to do with critical thinking or being critical of somebody's sinful behavior. And you need to be clear on that. So John here is saying, try or test, discern, examine, think critically of the spirits. Now, what do you mean the spirits? Is he talking about ghosts or demons that come and talk to you in your sleep? Well, that that could it would include that, absolutely. But he's talking about the spirit that's in a person. Right now, as if you're listening to my voice and I'm talking to you, there's a spirit behind what I'm saying. There's a spirit behind my words. And you need to test that. You need to try that. You know, what am I saying? Listen to my words. What am I saying? And you, the Holy Spirit, you need to discern. Like, if, is, is what this guy's saying? right on? Is he glorifying Christ? Is it pointing to Christ? What's, it, what's he saying here? Is this a, a weird doctrine? What, what's what's Brother Kapow saying here? And you need to think critically of, of what I'm saying constantly. It, it, John's telling us to do this. Think critically. Examine the spirits, whether they are of God. You know why? Because many false prophets are gone out into the world. You could be listening to a false prophet right now. I could be a false prophet that I came out from among the church and, um, you know, I got some weird vision, some weird thing. And, um, you know, the, I thought it was God, but, the, you know, uh, you know, I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to build a nine foot Jesus. And if you don't donate a million dollars to me by tomorrow, God's going to kill me. <clears throat> that Oral Roberts actually said that. So I didn't just make that up. That, that's exactly from Oral, Oral Roberts, uh, which seemed to start off to be a pretty good egg, but somewhere he went sideways and many people didn't discern that. And they gave him a lot of money and God didn't kill him. <laughs> and he actually built a nine foot Jesus. But uh, that's that's not of God. And your spirit needs to discern that because many false prophets have gone out into the world, into the world, into the cosmos, that satanic matrix that we live in. Okay. So then after warning you to discern the spirits, he goes a little further and he says in verse two, hereby, this is why, Know ye the spirit of God. Here's how you're going to know the spirit of God. Cause that's your next question. Well, you know, I want to discern brother Kapow, what he's saying, but how do I do that? How do I know that the spirit behind what he's saying is of God? And John says, cause every spirit that confesseth, that confesseth, that means assent to acknowledge confession is made that Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, the Messiah, the Messiah. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about Yeshua, the Messiah, is come. He already came in the flesh. That spirit is of God. So a lot of times I have seen in the past with deliverance ministries, 
and deliverance ministers and, and speaking, they will use this scripture a lot. And if they're dealing with demons, they'll say, you know, demon, you know, the demons talking out, rah, rah, my name is Legion, rah, 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 right? And the deliverance minister will say, you know, uh, did Jesus Christ come in the flesh? Did Jesus Christ come in the flesh? And, um, you know, the demon will say, yeah, you know, well, then you're good to go. <laughs> or or I, I've actually heard people do this. People have actually written me and told me something. You know, they've had some whacked out dream, whacked out vision. And they've tested the spirit of the vision and said, you know, did Jesus Christ come in the flesh? And they say, yeah, you know, so it's like that it must be of God. And that is a really a wrong application of this. It's not a magic formula that a demon says, yeah, Jesus Christ came in the flesh. You know what? The Bible says the demons believe and they tremble. <laughs> the Bible says, so you believe in God, big deal. The demons also believe and they tremble. They can confess that Jesus came in the flesh. This isn't a magic formula. This isn't um, a magic word they can't say. What John is saying is he that confesses, it's the spirit behind what that person is saying. If you're listening to my words right now, I'm pointing to Jesus Christ as being the Messiah. I'm pointing to Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh, as God made flesh and defeating the works of Satan so that you could be redeemed back to your God. That's the spirit of God speaking. That's not Antichrist speaking. Saying Antichrist is against Christ. It's words and behaviors and teachings that is against Christ in every sense. So what what John is saying is you you know the spirit of God because every spirit, a spirit that's in somebody or a dream, you know, or a vision that you've had or a book that you're reading or something you hear on YouTube or a minister on a podcast, you have to test that spirit and you'll know it's of God is if they're confessing, confessing, not just saying it, but acknowledging, living the life, giving the promise, they're confessing in their life, acknowledging, they're conceding, they're, um, they're declaring that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. They, in other words, they're a true worshiper of Jesus Christ. So not to beat a dead horse here, you know, keep going over it, but I just really want to emphasize, like I said, I've, I've heard a lot of deliverance ministers, people in, um, you know, the deliverance ministry dealing with demonic presence, use this as um, making the demon or making, you know, the person, did he come into flesh? Uh, or, you know, somebody new comes in your life. You get a new girlfriend, boyfriend, spouse, wife, you know, whatever. Somebody new comes in your life, you know, and they're talking Bible and going to church with you and, you know, but you got to test the spirits because, yeah, they don't, something don't seem right. You know, and you ask them straight out, you know, did, uh, did God come in the flesh? You know, did he come in the flesh? And they go, of course he did. You know, and he died, died on the cross for us, blah, blah, blah. So then you go, okay, well, then, you know, he's of God uh, because he's acknowledging that. And then the next moment, they're talking all kinds of weird Heresy, you know, all kinds of weird stuff saying, well, you know, all good dogs go to heaven. And I believe that, you know, it's all about intent. And if a person has good intent, God's going to acknowledge that. And you don't necessarily have to be, you know, you know, a follower of every commandment because, you know, they start talking weird stuff, but yet they confess that Christ came in the flesh. A demon could say that. So my point is a demon could say that John is saying a person who confesseth, who declares it, mainly with not so much their words, but with their lives. So if a person is saying that all the good dogs go to heaven and it's just about somebody's intent and all, they're obviously not worshipers of Jesus Christ. Because if they're worshipers of Jesus Christ, their life would reflect such a deep commitment to his commands and his ways and of a new nature that that kind of language wouldn't even be coming out. So you get my point? So that's used a lot. But look at the person's, it goes back to the fruit once again. You test every spirit that confesseth Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. The fruit. Okay, and then in verse three, he says the opposite. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And that's more obvious 
That's more obvious. And if you look at their life and it's not confessing that Christ came in the flesh, would, would, that Christ is king of their life, that they're submitted to the worship of him in all deeds and commands. And if their life's not exemplifying that, this is the spirit of antichrist, which is against Christ. It's not just pseudo Christ. It's not just a false teacher. It's actually anti, antichristos. It's an opponent of the Messiah. It's actually an adversary of the Messiah. So it's not just a pseudo Christ. It's not just a cheese its pretending to be Christ. It's not just a, a false teacher or a false prophet. It's actually opposed. So the, the doctrine, the error is designed to oppose Christ. All right. Uh, that one you should be able to recognize pretty easily, but sometimes it's not because it's a poop sandwich. They're giving you truth on the top. They're giving you truth on the bottom and inside is the, the crap, right? So that spirit is antichrist that confesses not Jesus has come into flesh. And then John says, whereof he's talking about the antichrist. He's talking about the spirit of antichrist, whereof you have heard that it should come. So in the past, the audience that John is writing to have been taught that this opposing spirit is going to come. It's going to come and really oppose the gospel of Christ, the message that God became flesh to defeat the works of the Satan and to redeem his creatures back to himself, back to that garden state, right? Right. And he says that time's going to come where it's where that opposition is going to be here. And then he says, and even now, now this is you know 1900 years ago, 1800 years ago, he wrote this. And even now, already it is in the world. So when John wrote this, the apostle John, a lot of credibility, a lot of street cred here is saying right now it's already here. Antichrist is already here. Antichrist the spirit that opposes Antichristo, that opposes Messiah, anti-Messiah, has been with us for several thousand years now. Um, and it increases. It increases. We see it more and more every day. I see it in people's comments, you know, on their on Facebook and stuff like that. You know, somebody will post something you know really good, and a lot of people are blessed by it and you know, thanks for posting that. That really made my day. Jesus is like that. And you always got these, man, these antichrist people up there and they just say weird, weird stuff. Oh yeah. You say people believe in a God that kills kids, you know, and if they're just anti-God, they're anti-Christ. You know, it's pretty obvious that spirit, you know, and you can test that spirit. That's, you know, that's not of God. The harder one is when they're saying things that sound Christian, you know, they're giving you a poop sandwich and uh, a lot of the stuff they're saying, but their life doesn't really coincide with confessing Christ coming in flesh and being true Messiah worshipers. That's a little harder. And that's where that spirit, that discernment has to come in. And you have to listen to, uh, for lack of a better word, your gut. You have to listen to your gut feelings a lot of times. And sometimes, you know, we, we're raised not to judge a book by the cover and, you know, don't judge and don't be mean. But sometimes, man, if you just feel it in your spirit, you, you, you've got to pray about it because the, the Holy Spirit's trying to tell you about someone or something, you know, a, a pastor, a church, a friend, somebody who came into your life, things that are being said that just may not be totally, you know, 100% kosher. So you got to be careful what you, you get in that ear gate, right? So in verse four, he says, ye are of God, little children. So then, then he tells his audience, the readers is they that are reading this letter. You are of God, little children, and you have overcome them. So he's, he's telling them, be, be careful of the false teachers, the seducers that come out from us. They're not confessing Jesus Christ come in the flesh. They're not true worshipers. They've came out from us. They've gone into the world. They're antichrist. They're opposed to, to Christ. They want to do harm to the message of Messiah the image of Messiah. And he says, but you, you little, little, little ones, little children, the, the word is technion, you know, it's little, little kids, a little child, not an infant, but you know, it's a term of endearment. 
you have overcome them. And this is another scripture people love to quote, and it's a great one to memorize and quote. It is. I would suggest doing it before it changes on us. Um, (laughs) Some of you know what I'm talking about. But it says, you are of God, little children, and have overcome them because, here's why you've overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. That's a great one to know because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Memorize it. It might change someday. You might notice a difference going, wait, it always says greater is he that is in the world than is in you. Now it says greater is it that is in you. You know, it'll change. Be some weird time warp thing. And uh, you're going to swear, oh man, it always said he, not it. And everything. no, it's always said it. It's always said it. So, (laughs) be aware of this stuff because that is happening man it is happening (laughs) more and more but so far this is um this is pure right here it's because greater is he greater is the spirit of god that spirit of christ that's in you the holy spirit is greater than the satanic world system than the spirits in the, the world system so you've already overcome it you've already come it you know So that's a very good confidence booster that we need to know that. And here's the deal, you know, instead of being overcome and brought into spiritual bondage by them, who's them, the antichrist, right? We can look at second Peter two 19, while they promise them Liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption for of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought in bondage. Whoever overcomes you, you're a slave, right? So if you're listening to false doctrine, false error, you become in bondage to that. And John said, you have overcome that spiritual bondage because greater is he. You got the real spirit. That's how you've tried the spirit. You tested the spirit. You got the real spirit in you than he that's in the world. And even in John 10, 8 through 5, he says, All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. Okay, that's in the Gospel of John. That's Jesus. All that ever came before me, before Christ, before Messiah, are thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not hear them. Wow. So Jesus didn't say they're thieves and robbers and, um, you know, you better really give them a 12 point, you know, questionnaire and blah, blah, blah. He says that you won't even hear them. You'll, you'll just know you'll discern, Hey, that's not my master. That's not my shepherd. You don't recognize your voices. You only recognize the voice of your shepherd. That's where we have to be spiritually. And you can only do that if you're in the vine, if you're abiding in Christ, like we taught last week, it's the abiding in Christ. That makes all the difference in the world. So the sheep didn't even hear him. A stranger will not follow, but will flee from Christ. Do you understand that? For they know not the voice. The sheep don't know the voice of strangers. They only know the voice of God. Okay, so greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And they, in verse five says, they are of the world. Therefore speak they of the world and the world heareth them. This is huge. This is huge. He's talking about the antichrist. He's talking about the antichrist, plural, antichrist people, the antichrist spirit, anti-God. It says they're of the world. Who wants to be of the world? You know, the world is, that's this is Satan's matrix. It's his little symbol matrix. It's his little program he's running here <laughs> for his little time. They're of the world. And you know what? Because they're of the world, they speak of the world. Their language is of the world. That's why... They want to build bigger and bigger buildings. That's why they want to make more and more money. That's why they need more and more people. That's why they have more and more programs. Do you get what I'm saying? Because they're of the world. It's, that's why, you know, uh, Peter Drucker, 
the the, the marketing uh, <clears throat> guru, the business marketing guru, Peter Drucker's philosophies were embraced by Rick Warren and all the purpose driven churches. The book Purpose Driven, you know, was was written because they're of the world. They want those marketing strategies like McDonald's or any other corporation to grow the church. They're always growing the church, not realizing it's God who gives the increase because they're, they're of the world. They don't confess Christ came in the flesh. Oh, yeah, they'll say every Sunday, oh, yeah, Christ died on the cross. But they don't they're not confessing. They're not living it. They're not in the vine. They're not of the world. You, you discern that. So they are of the world, therefore they speak they of the world. And guess what? The world hears them. Now you've heard me rant and rave. I say, hey, you can't be a high-ranking politician. You can't be on the New York Times bestseller list. You can't be on Oprah. You can't be on Larry King. You're not going to be on Jimmy Fallon's Tonight Show as a biblical Christian. You're just not. Because if the world is praising you, if you're a musician, a Christian musician, and um, all of a sudden you're getting Grammys and the world's just praising you for your gospel music. Do you got a problem there? Because the world should not love you. The, sh- the world should be opposed to your message. So why does the world, why are, why is the world hearing you? Why is the world hearing them? I, you know, I'm not, I'm not making this up. I know probably a lot of people disagree with me, but I'm not making this up. The apostle John who walked with, with Christ said this, he wrote this. They're of the world, therefore they speak of the world, and the world hears them. The world hears them. They're, they're false prophets. They're antichrist. The world hears them. They like them. They derive their spirit and teaching from the world. It's an unregenerate human nature. It's ruled over and possessed by Satan, the prince of the world. It's simple. It's, it's that simple. They draw the matter of their conversation from, from their own life, from their opinions, and the feelings of the world. That's, that's how they speak the, the word of the world. They speak of, of the world. Their feelings are all about the world. You know, it's not of God. And the world hears them. Now, in John, the Gospel of John, 15, 18, and 19, Jesus says, if the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. (laughs) So if the world hates you, maybe you're not getting that promotion because uh, they call you Bible Bob at work, right? Uh, You know, maybe you're not, maybe people aren't buying your books. Like, you know, you were hoping to. Maybe people um, just aren't embracing your music, the message you put in, or uh, the artwork you're doing, or the ministry you're doing. They're not embracing, they're not really recognizing or embracing you. In fact, they're getting dogged for it. Uh, You shouldn't marvel that. Because Jesus even says, if the world hate you, didn't you know it? It hated me before they hated everything he did. The, the, phony, the phony religious system of Christ's day that God didn't set up, but yet they were living, the Pharisees and the scribes and that Sanhedrin and the Sadducees. It was, it was this, this false matrix religious system that they weren't even complying with God's law. That's what hated the true Messiah. It was those people. They hated it. They hated him. Okay, I'm going to take a break and I'm going to come back with the last verse and we'll then we'll wrap it up. Demons in my marriage bed, a true story of spiritual warfare, changed the way my spouse and I conduct spiritual battle and has increased our alertness level to the tactics of Satan. This is an excellent training manual for building a stronger marriage by exposing the tactics your enemies use against you from all online digital retailers. God bless you all. Okay, here we are. here we are. We're back. Just remind you that book, Demons in a Marriage Bed, written by uh, London myself. True story of spiritual warfare. It not only tells our testimony what we went through, but also a manual for fighting uh, spiritual warfare, demonic beings in your haunted house and your haunted lives, and it's stuff we learned uh, the hard way. Wrote it down to benefit you. It's available 
everywhere. Get on Amazon, um, you know, as a paperback or ebook. I get smash words, uh, you know, iBooks, all that stuff. All right. So let's let's conclude with verse six because we just talked about the Antichrist people who are not confessing. They're not living the life. They're not abiding the divine that Christ came in the flesh. They're not, they're not declaring that in their life, even if they have language because they come out from the church, they have that phony language, but they're false teachers. It's a warning. Many have gone out into the world from the church and they're of the world and the world hears them. The, the, yeah, we understand what they're saying. We understand what they're saying. That's why guys like Rob Bell and, you know, uh, that other guy, Love Wins, that dude, you know, people love those books. <laughs> they love that stuff because the world hears it. You know, ooh, I could be a Christian and God accepts me for my total gayness because God is love and I love my partner. They love that stuff because it justifies their sin. It, it, it's the water loves going the, the, the easy way. It just takes the easy way, the easy path down. It doesn't want to resist. Um, you know, and it's hard. You know, being a Christian is not easy because you have to deny yourself and you have to pick up that cross and uh, you have to follow Christ. And Christ went, Christ went to the, the death and burial. Verse six says, we are of God. So he's so confident that he tells them in verse four, you are of God, little children. And now in verse six, he says, we are of God. Now, who's he talking to? Who's he talking about? Is he talking about you and me here? He didn't even know you and me. He's talking about the apostles. He's talking about these original guys who walked and ate and, and taught and ministered with and, and touched, you know, God made flesh. And he says, we are of God. And he that knoweth God heareth us. I mean, that's pretty confident. Don't you wish you could say that? I wish I could say that. You know, hey, I'm of God. And if you listen to me, then you're of God. If you don't listen to me, you're not. <laughs> now, if I said that, you'd all go, man, you know, you've gone off the rails. But, but, the, but, but Apostle John, he says that. We are of God. And he that knoweth God hears us. He that is not of God heareth not us. And then because of that, John says, therefore, hereby, know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. How does he know if, if there's a spirit of truth in someone or a spirit of error? Because they're not listening. They're, they're not hearing what the apostles are saying. That, that, that's how we know they have a spirit of error. But if they're listening to what the apostles are saying, they know they have a spirit of truth. And so the thing is, is John... And Peter, you know, those James, they're not with us anymore, right? Except on the scriptures. We have, we have these letters that are contained in our New Testament. They're letters written to various churches and various bodies. And they, they outline doctrine and theology. And they explain Old Testament thinking and ideology. We have those. And so if you're not, if you're not listening to that, if you're not, know, if you're not hearing that, as you read the scriptures, then you don't have a spirit of truth. You have a spirit of error. So if the Bible's telling you sin not and abide in Christ and, and get a new nature, take up your cross and follow him daily. If the Bible's telling you that and you're not obeying that, then you have a spirit of error, not of truth. Yeah, and that's how you test the spirits. Any man, any person, confess not that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. You're not listening. Yeah. So John is saying we, those are the true teachers of Christ in contrast to them, the Antichrist. They're not, the, they're not teachers of Christ. The Apostle John, the apostles are of God and therefore they speak of God. Contrast that to what we just read in verse five. They are of the world, therefore they speak, what? Of the world. And the world heareth them. But now John says, we speak of God. Who do you want to listen to? Someone who speaks of God or someone who speaks of the world? If you prefer the world, you have the spirit of error. John is very black and white. Every week we do this show, I keep saying that. He's very black and white. There's no gray here. You can't find gray. It's either or. Wow. 
He that knoweth God hears, listens to the apostles. The word, the word is to hear. It means in various senses. In other words, an audience. Um, you can hear to be noise, to be to understand, to hearken, to give audience to. You know what I'm saying? To attend to, to consider, to understand. So we are of God, and he that knoweth God understands us, considers us, gives us gives us a platform. What we're writing here, they ponder it. <laughs> But, but he that don't, don't do that, if you don't ponder it, if you don't go, well, could, could this be true? Do we have to buy in Christ? Do we have to really quit sinning and just you know, give our life over and not be of the world? You, you, you do that, then you, you're the spirit of error, not the spirit of truth. Because you're not, you're not pondering it. You're like, ah, that was written you know, 2,000 years ago. And, uh, you know, times have changed. You know, I love my gay lover. I'm not promiscuous. I'm not a temple prostitute. I'm in love. Yeah. Yeah. So the spirit, which comes from God and teaches truth, that's the only, that's the only truth you have. Yeah. It's that, it's really that simple. They're of God and they know of God as a father being a child of God. You know, God, that's what he says. Little children, you know, you've overcome it. You know, God, in 1 John 2, 13 to 14, he says, I write unto you fathers because you have known him that, that is from the beginning. And I write unto you young men because you have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you young children because you've, you've known the father. You know him. And then you, you, you hear what, what we, now we hear what the apostles have written. In John 18, 37, it says, Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou the king, Jesus? You know, answer thou sayest, you, you are a king, and you know, this sin was born, and for this cause came I into the world, and right? This is truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Yeah. Hereby know we. Hereby, this is how we know the difference between the spirit of truth and error. First John 4, 2, 6 says, Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses, confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. You're a Messiah follower. Hereby, it's by their confessing or not confessing Jesus. That's, that's not just verbally. It's with their lives. It's with their whole being. It's what they teach. It's what they do. It's who they are. Yeah. And then you can tell the difference. The spirit of truth, it comes from God and it teaches truth. And then there's a spirit of error. And that spirit, it comes from Satan. And Satan seduces into error, just like he did in the very, very beginning to Eve. And he questioned God's word. Did God say you will not die? Surely you're not going to die. From the very beginning, it's a spirit that first it seduces by its worldly wisdom. Ah, oh, that makes sense. You know, that makes sense. And then it causes you to err and you go sideways. All right. Okay, so next week we'll start in verse seven. And there's a lot of love here about loving one another and loving God board of God, knowing God, and we're going to dig in that a little bit. So for now, good night, and we will talk to you next week. The world is heading for destruction Like a fool chasing his wine